Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Polyhedron Cladicast, episode 23. It's us again. We're here. Woohoo! Oh, God, just run away. Seriously, this one's going to be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> You're filling us with confidence already, Andy. Well, of course. It's it's, it's always good to set expectation right from the off, just so we're, our, our, the crowd of uh, followers knows exactly where they stand, right at the bottom of a very scraped barrel. Don't listen to him, listeners. He's talking bullshit as usual. <laughs> that's why I'm here. If they've listened to us before, they know exactly what to expect. And that's why they come back. The fools, the fools. I've got to admit, we've had quite a lot of positive comments these last few weeks. We have. We? It's quite odd have you guys been paying them <laughs> don't, we don't say, talk thankfully about that. it's been mixed in with plenty of insults so it out. that's good we've been called monkeys well-intentioned morons and what did mike from who dares rolls call us he probably called us a <laughs> but well he called me a <laughs> i don't know about you two <laughs> uh straight okay. in there with a the c-bomb <laughs> <laughs> it's time to get editing just for Steve. you mike <laughs> that's that's the one word I'm going to bleep. I hope you oh, realise that. That's fair enough. Yes, that's fine. <laughs> Maybe we could dub him over saying something like crackers or uh, <laughs> conundrum. <laughs> Andy, can you say conundrum? No, I can't. Damn it. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is not going here at all. <laughs> What a fantastic start. <laughs> We're here today to talk about some board games. <laughs> yes, stop bringing us back in line. This is fun. <laughs> what sure was that aware. last word we were called? I can't remember. Was it Phil the Sheep? <laughs> I thought you said conundrums. <laughs> that too. Right, so board games. So, yes. I think we've lost Steve. <laughs> In case you weren't aware, this is supposed to be a podcast about board games and other forms of tabletop games. So, um, Emphasis before... on the supposed to be. It's supposed to be, yes. So what uh, what games have you guys been looking into or playing? Um, well, there's, there's been quite a list, really. It's a busy month. It's a busy month for your bank account, Lewis, looking at all the Kickstarters you've been backing. Oh, Jesus, Are you still yeah. eating, Andy? What? <laughs> Are you still eating? No. No, I mean, because if you're spending this much money oh, on board games, presumably you're going hungry, right? <laughs> um, well, you know, something's got to give, basically, yeah. So no no, 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 um, no food, because, I mean, I have to carry on drinking beer. That's, that's mandatory. Obviously, yeah. And obviously, you know, board games need to be paid for. So uh, something's got to give, yeah. so no food for me. Besides, I mean, I could, to be fair, I could do with losing a couple of stones. So. If you carry on with a beer, that's not going to be uh, such a great move, but... no. Oh well, we'll 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 get round it. Um, but yes, yeah. My uh, currently, I've got four live Kickstarters, uh, two of which actually started today. <laughs> Back to today. Yes, one of which is brass. Brass. All about t- trains. You mean brass? Surely no, brass. I mean brass. Brass only has one R in it. <laughs> <coughs> yes, you southern ponts. Look, just because you guys are born uh, way too far north. No. We, we should point out that John is well represented on this new version of Brass because there is the traditional Lancashire map as well as a new Birmingham map. Oh, and I did used to live in Birmingham for a while. But then he was well, asked to leave. Well, I at the moment. Oh, <laughs> going a bit nice there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, morning, great mate. And, uh, we've got uh, some rock-tastic tunes on for the, for the show today. Uh, what are you listening to do, great mate? I'm listening to Brass, mate. (laughs) Fantastic, mate. So what's brass then, Andy? What's brass? Yeah, what's brass? Brass is uh, a metal quite often used for uh, door knockers. It is also the name of a uh, train and trading based game. Remake, actually, which has been titivated with the, uh, the modern style. It looks very, very pretty, actually. It, it, It really, really does. It's a bizarrely short Kickstarter campaign, actually. 22 days. So I don't know if I've missed the start of it. It started Monday, so we're Wednesday now. It started Easter Monday. So it would have been a 24-day campaign. Yeah. It's a curiously odd number, but hey, you know, never mind. I've seen some of the artwork. I agree, it does look very pretty. It does indeed. The only thing I haven't really grasped from the bits and pieces that I've seen is uh, what you actually do in it. Um, I don't know. (laughs) 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 And you backed it. Well, of course. <laughs> it, it looks pretty. extremely Squirrel. dry and boring. Of course I've backed it. <laughs> it's a remake of an old Martin Wallace game. 
I got to admit, I've not played it myself. It's had a couple of versions in the past, actually, and even Martin Martin Wallace has updated it over and changed it into a couple of other games. But it's basically a railway development game. It's supposed to be reasonably historically accurate, so it's about the development of the railways in Lancashire or Birmingham. Well, the Birmingham's completely new. It's a completely new map. Okay. So, so that's been developed just for this version of the game. But mm-hmm. the original one was Lancashire, so it's got Birkenhead all the way up to to go up to the Lake District. Birkenhead's not in Lancashire. I know it's not in Lancashire, but <laughs> it's on the map. <laughs> Have you seen well, the Birmingham map? The Birmingham map's got Worcester in it. That's not in Birmingham either. Oh, good grief. Fair well, enough. Worcester's in Worcestershire, and Worcestershire does reach all the way into Birmingham. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah well, 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 well. Artistic okay. license. Mm. <laughs> one interesting thing is actually they're actually selling them as two different copies. So you can buy one or the other or both, which is quite nice. Mm. Guess which one I've gone for. Well, I hope you're going for the Lancashire one since you're a Lancashire lad. I went for both. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no you're going to be uh, scraping crumbs off the kitchen at work, aren't you? I really am. I'll be <laughs> licking the bin for juice. Okay, so that's one of the four. What's the other three? Uh, well, the other three is the enduring one, the City of Kings, which we have mentioned before, uh-huh. which we're all quite Eight keen days on. to go. Yes, indeed. No long, not so long. It's doing about well. About four days to go when you listen to this. Hopefully. Yep. We've both kick-started that one, haven't we? We have, yes. Which one did you go for? Um, I couldn't help myself. I've gone for the deluxe. Yes, me too. I think it's probably the best value one for what you get in the box. So I thought so. And I didn't really need a chest to put things in. I've got enough boxes that are too big for the games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think the deluxe one is probably the best because you get all the, the anti knock trays and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, we've gone for that one. Lots of good stuff. And what was the third one I've gone for? Oh, yeah, I've gone for Rise to Nobility, which is kind of the second game from Final Frontier Games, which is sort of the sequel to Cavern Tavern. So I've had my eye on that one for quite a while. Again, that does look very pretty. It does. And we shall be reviewing it in the very near future. Ooh. When it arrives. When it, <laughs> Well, no, as in, in the next couple of weeks. Ooh. Because our friend Jay at Breacher 18 is uh, furnishing me with a copy of it. Excellent. Some sneaky peeks. Indeed. Mm. So we'll, uh, we'll get a, a sneak peek. I shall get quite excited about that and hopefully not make a mess of the board. And uh, we'll uh, <clears throat> pass it on from there. And the fourth one is the f- another one I backed today. The campaign started at 6 o'clock this evening. I was getting sassed by uh, Phalanx Games this afternoon. <laughs> um, and that is, What's that uh, involve, Andy? Sorry? Being What's sassed. Being sassed. Sassed. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you know, a bit of positive attitude from them. A bit of bants. <laughs> I'm even getting a beer from them. Uh, He's just making words up now. <laughs> no. This is uh, Hannibal, which uh, I've been looking forward to for ooh, about a year when uh, we saw the prototype at Expo last year. So uh, that has finally been uh, launched now. Yeah, I was expecting that in October, to be honest with you. Yeah, they've pushed it back, but they've, they've combined it now because it's Hannibal and Hamlicar. So there's an extra okay. bit to it. Mm. So I guess they've, they've spent the extra time sort of merging two games, adding bits to it, and it does look rather good. Um, so the game is, I mi- and rather annoyingly, I missed the early bird on the Kickstarter by about half an hour today. God damn it. So I was driving home. But it is £65 for that with obviously all of the, the stretch and stuff in it as well. So That's that not looks bad. very, very good. No, indeed. There's a lot in the box by the looks of things. I mean, the prototype looked good enough. Um, so this is going to be uh, even better. So yeah, I'm going to be destitute at the end of May. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> destitute, but surrounded by beautiful board games. Yes. <laughs> Starving but happy. <laughs> well, the, the way to look at it is you've now saved me money, Andy. <laughs> Do you know how much comfort that gives me? <laughs> Absolutely oh, none. It's actually better than that because it's not just Steve you save money. You've also saved me money as well. <laughs> I mean, you're basically, you know, you're a charity. <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm just such a caring guy. <laughs> he just gives and gives and... Andy, stop giving. <laughs> <laughs> so the girls tell me, yes. Oh dear. Oh God. <laughs> so. You can give sassy. Yeah, because I was looking at a couple of them and um, I'd, I'd have to back them now because you've done it for me. So Well, I might still pull out of brass depending on how finances go and leave that one to you, Mr. Tudor. But we shall see how things, we'll, how things pan we'll out. We'll see how that goes, yeah. Well, because I've got my own Gloomhaven at the moment and. Oh, I'm so torn. 
<laughs> you should probably just buy it, you know. Yeah, Why not? It's, it's, not, it's not a cheap Kickstarter, but at the same time, everyone who's played it is absolutely raving about it. So, And it sounds like my kind of game. Yeah. You know, bizarrely enough, I'm not interested in the slightest. Hmm. I don't know why. It just hasn't gripped me. I am ungrippered. <laughs> I'm not in the least bit grippered. Indeed. <laughs> it is totally non-gripped. But I don't know why, but hey, everyone says it's good. So yes, Steve, you should totally buy it so we can play it. <laughs> yes, I agree. Hmm. That's uh, that's your part of the pact uh, there, Steve. You can play uh, City of Kling- Kings with us if you buy city that one. City of Kings. <laughs> <You heard. laughs> that sounds like a city that is bereft of toilet roll. <laughs> <laughs> a city that needs more fibre. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, but good maybe grief. The, maybe that was the thing on the track we kept breaking up. Maybe it was uh, like faith, morale and fibre. <laughs> <laughs> and if you get far enough, an Andrex puppy comes bouncing into the uh, into the city. I think Frank's already lost faith in all of us. So <laughs> oh, yes, he's never going to talk to us again. <laughs> I know, he, there's no such thing as bad publicity. So, <laughs> well, you say that. <laughs> uh, yeah, up to a I point. I think <laughs> this Kickstarter is going to succeed in spite of what we've done, rather than because. <laughs> well, to be fair, I think he's done pretty well. Because wasn't it like uh, 30,000 he needed and they're up to like 185,000? Oh, it, I'd it, call it that doing, a win. It is. It's doing it's... ludicrously well. And I think well-deserved. It's a bloody good game. So Can't wait to see what the final thing looks like. Yeah, that's not out until next year, though. Yeah, it's going to be a long wait. We'll have to oh, find no. some other Kickstarters in the meantime. <laughs> uh, yeah, way ahead of you there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about some Kickstarters you've actually received then, Andy. <laughs> oh, okay then. Yeah, so actually, the you know the uh, the long the long running saga for the uh, the Kickstarter campaigns that began about this time last year actually with with Cavin Tavern actually and Arve Roma. Um, one I received it was either early this year or late last year, uh, which has received a lot of attention over the last sort of eight or nine months for one reason or another is Martians. I think it's just That's, one reason, isn't it? Well, well, no, actually, there are there's a couple. But yeah, oh, mostly okay. one. Uh, now, this is Martians, a story of civilization. Spelt wrongly with a Z. It's the Queen's S, don't you know? Anyway, this has been, well, in doing the rounds in the community for various reasons. Uh, but as Steve says, one big reason being the rule book, which is, well, quite frankly, fucking atrocious. Not to put too fine a point <laughs> on it. And what do we do when we find a shit rule book? We rewrite it. We do indeed. And by we, I mean ye. <laughs> yes. Well, as an act of, I would say an act of penance, but as an act of generosity towards the uh, the community, I took it upon myself, with the help of a couple of other people, and for the 22nd podcast in a row, Mr. Grogan's going to get mentioned again. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, he's going to invoice us soon, I think. Or we should invoice him, one of the two. Yeah, come on, let's get it right. We should be paid. <laughs> um... I, I did rewrite the rule book, which is now available on Board Game Geek for anybody who's interested. Um, but I won't dwell too much on that because I, I think Red Imp have taken enough flack for uh, the rule book now, so everyone knows it's bad. So um, if you actually take the time to get through the rule book, eventually, it's like swallowing down you know an entire bucket of wallpaper paste. It's not pleasant. Is that but- your version or theirs? <laughs> theirs. Mine's actually rather good. The game itself is actually quite good and bloody difficult. I was going to say, the game must have been good enough for you to consider that you had to rewrite the rulebook. Well, see, this is the thing. The more I played it, the more I liked it. And I got to the point where, because of what was going on with the rulebook and all the discussions in the community, I thought, well, do you know what? I actually quite like the game. I mean, it's worker placement, so I can't see John liking it too much, but you never know. Um, well, you say that, but I was quite good at that uh, wine game, whatever that was. You were, you <laughs> see. All, all the complaining, and you still came second, so they can't be that bad. <laughs> And More luck than judgment, I think. <laughs> potentially. But Martians is mostly worker placement, but with a, with a few twists on it. You don't necessarily use all of your workers in your turn because you're limited to what are called time units. So each action can take between one and three time units, but you only get three to spend. But you can do more than one action with putting a meeple down, depending on where you put it and so on and so forth. I won't spend too long explaining all of that because John's mind has just blown. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bored already. 
But back on topic, I, I actually decided to do this because I like the game so much that I thought, well, do you know what? I don't want the game to suffer just because the rule book's pants. I thought, mm-hmm. well, if we can... Because there's a lot of people on the various Facebook community groups and stuff saying, I don't even want to touch the game because the rule book's so bad. And I thought, well, that's a bit of a shame because it is actually quite good. So if I can get people into it at the very least to look past it and give it a go, then surely that's a good thing. So I did. And I'm glad I did because it is a good game. It is good fun. And you can play it solo, co-op, semi-co-op or competitive. So there's lots of different ways to play. Competitive, you say? Yes, indeed. (laughs) Although, to be fair, I understand the game was actually written primarily as a semi-co-op. So you're all kind of working together, but you can still pull dick moves. My favourite kind of (laughs) co-op. Yes. So... Essentially, the idea is you're building a colony on Mars. Some of it's built, a lot of it isn't, and you've got to survive. If you're in the cooperative type games, then you have you can pick a scenario, a mission of quite a few. There's, I think there's 11, something like that, in the box, in the Kickstarter box that you can choose from. And Red Imp have just released a scenario creator, uh, which is also on Board Game Geek, on their uh, little area there. So you can make your own, which is really good as well. That's quite a cool idea. It is, yeah. It's really good artwork. You can put them all together and sort of build your own, print them all out, and uh, you can you can make your own sort of expansions to the game, which is quite a nice idea, actually. So what kind of um, sort of scenarios and things do you have to survive on there? They vary, but generally speaking, it either involves little expeditions or preparations for expeditions or building additional facilities and things like that. So part of the way the game works is one of the, the areas on the border you can put your your little workers is uh, the landing pod which allows you to do these extra actions so you can either build an additional facility or you can grab resource or stockpile things like food or medicine depending on what the scenario requires part of the way the game works is that to keep your colony running you need to produce food medicine and oxygen oxygen being quite important if you're in a martian environment with no air if you fail to produce oxygen at the end of the uh, the cycle then your colonists all die which is quite hilarious. Which would be bad, right? It's generally <laughs> bad, yes. If you don't produce medicine or food, it's not quite as bad. It's just more annoying. <laughs> um, so depending on how you're playing, whether you're co- cooperative or semi-co-op or competitive, depend the, the, the ramifications of that may affect everybody, may affect one person, obviously, depending on the, 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 the type of game being played. And the game is a, a fixed length so at the end of usually either four for most styles of play or five for the competitive version cycle so the cycle consists of a number of rounds starts with three if you breed enough colonists you can unlock a fourth round which gets you an extra go um so the game varies in length it lasts about two hours generally speaking so it's not massively long and it all works rather well the one mode i haven't fully played yet is the semi co-op which i'm told is probably the best but I do like the co-op version, and I have played the competitive and the solo versions as well, and they all work rather well. Well, it sounds like we need to uh, fix that then. Yes, yes, I think we should. But it's a game for, two. well, I say one to four players. Presumably the semi-co-op doesn't really work with just one player, though. Uh, no, no, you need obviously more than <laughs> more than uh, more than one. Stab myself so well in the foot, shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are obviously limitations on the on the style of play, but I mean the co-op mode and the solo mode are basically the same idea. There's just slightly different starting conditions. The semi-co-op, obviously, you need at least two players. No, that sounds interesting. We'll have to give it a go and report back. Yeah, there is. Um, there's quite a lot of bling with the game as well for the um, the Kickstarter edition. So there's sort of extra little sort of astronauts and additional cards and additional missions, and there's little miniatures that you could buy as an add-on that represent all the little buildings that you can build as well. So it looks quite pimp. But yeah, even I've the basic pictures, artwork is very good. It does look quite pretty. Yeah, it is exceptionally good looking game, and it is very it's very well made. It's good high quality um, components and stuff, so they haven't skimped. So they've got the uh, value for money bit right at least, even if the the rule books a bit on the shit side. But I am I am told that they are rewriting the rule book at the moment, which is due out in May. And by rewriting, they mean stealing yours. <laughs> I don't know. My <laughs> understanding is they are writing their own version, but we shall see how things pan out. So have you played any of the other Martian games to compare it to? Uh, annoyingly, no. I haven't played his big competitor, Terraforming Mars. I've seen it, but that's as close as I've got. Um, so I don't know. But uh, they're, very different, they're very different games, though. There's another one coming from Portal Games 
that's called The First Martians. I think that's going to be a closer game to this one. Okay. So, so that's more that. about... It's, that's more going to be more of a semi-cooperative and... Or cooperative, you know, trying to build a colony on Mars. Terraform Mars is highly competitive, mm-hmm. from what I've seen, with some cooperative elements in that you're working together to build up the oxygen and build up the water on the planet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I must admit, I've not played Terraform Mars, which I'm a bit annoyed I haven't by this point, because it's everyone's still raving about this game. They are, yeah. I mean, it seems to be quite Marmite. What do you think? Most people seem to like really rate it. Um, it's come under fire for the second reprint because of its price, yeah, as we've but, seen. Yeah, but that wasn't really... Everyone was complaining about the price, but that was more because people were actually charging the correct price for it. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than heavily discounting it, I think, was the problem. It does seem expensive for what it is, though. I think it's very expensive for what it is, personally, mm. but it's a Stronghold Games game, and in the UK, those games are never cheap. Yeah. There's a few of their games in the past I've looked at and kind of gone, do you know what? That's a bit much for me. Yeah. Is that just because the pound's a bit shit at the moment, or or generally they tend to price them high? The, it came out just after the pound went tits up. Yeah, okay. But Stronghold games have never been cheap games. Because mm. there's a game they've done which is a, a remake of the uh, Battlestar Galactica Express or BSG Express, which was a print and play game you could make. But of course, they couldn't make a BSG game because Fancy Flight Games already own those rights. I think mm. it's called Dark Moon, which is really highly regarded. But when that first came out, I think that was like 50 odd quid RRP. And you looked at it and kind of went, okay, if that had been 40 quid, I would have just snapped that up kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, and this, this extra is... sort of five or ten makes you go, ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Makes you think twice. But, yeah, the pound hasn't helped. And then what's happened is because it's been so popular, Terraforming Mars, it's sold out almost straight away each time. Huh. Yes. So, they, I mean, um, Stephen Barnico, who's the head of Stronghold, is actually, was actually on the UK Facebook group answering some of the questions that people were putting criticisms and basically said it's the biggest print run he's ever done was the first print run and he's now on the third print run and each time he's doubled the amount he's printing and the <laughs> game is still selling out as soon as it comes out it's got to say something hasn't it yeah which suggests to me it is a good game or at least it's a very very popular game but i agree it's i think it's rp 66 pounds in that region which i've also heard the component quality isn't very good yeah, this is the thing. I, I mean, I've seen the game quite close up in our sort of Tuesday night group in Worcester, and it was played God, it was two or three weeks ago, I think I last saw it, uh, with everything sort of sat out. And I wasn't stunned by it. There just seems to be a lot of card, like as in little, just little cards, um, lots of little plastic squares, um, and not a lot else. So I wasn't blown away by. It. I mean, Martians definitely looks better in terms of its its appearance on the table, and that the, the components look a lot more impressive. I know we shouldn't be saying oh, bling isn't you know bling's all all about, and it's not. But it is nice to have. I and mean, if you're paying that amount of money for a game, you, you're kind of expecting high quality, lots in the box, decent components, all that sort of jazz. And I wasn't over overawed by by. Uh, colonising Mars at all. Terraforming Mars. Terraforming Mars, even. Yeah, that one. I would say, as I said, the gameplay must be really, really good, though, because it's so popular. It must be. Yes. It's got to be something to it, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> the other one is, uh, it's coming out, and it's going to be premiered at the UK Games Expo, actually, is uh, Pocket Mars. Pocket Mars? By uh, Bud Dice. Another one by bloody hell, they've been busy. Oh, God, yeah, they're premiering, like, three games at the Expo. They have so, been busy. So what's different about that one? Um, that's more like a 15-20 minute card game. Hmm. But the similar kind of theme, it's you're going to Mars and terraforming it and all that kind of thing, but rather than being this in-depth two-hour strategy game, it's 15-20 minutes kind of thing. Oh, okay. So it might be more suitable for my attention span. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Don't <laughs> both agree so listen. readily, you bastards. <laughs> We've yeah. got the measure of you, Cage. Indeed. <laughs> if it's going to be a long game, it needs to be a simple one. <laughs> Ding! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so yeah, that was that was Martians: A Story of Civilization. I so say it was about the time we covered it because I've had it for ages and played it goodness knows how many times. So, mm. and uh, I've I've had a bit of a bee in my bonnet about it. So, <laughs> kind of a good bee, but a bee nonetheless. I didn't have the chance to play it on Tuesday because I managed to get, to get to the Worcester Gaming Night on Tuesday this week because I was catching up on Time Stories. Ooh. Oh yes, of course. You said, Andy, bring Martians, bring Martians. And I so I did. And then you sort of judas me and brought time stories. And everyone, oh, let's play that instead. <laughs> Sting. <laughs> to be fair, I've had that I've had that expedition endurance module for time stories in my bag, ready to go for about four months, it feels. And Will has been asking to play that since we played the last time stories. So it's Getting on for probably nine months since we last played Time Stories. It's like, when's the next oh, one out? Yeah. When's the next one out? Is it out? Can we play it? Can we play it? <laughs> so the question is, was it worth the wait? No. Ooh, <laughs> burn. Why not? Um, well, so you've played Time Stories, haven't you, Andy? I have, yes. I played, I've, only, I've only played the, the first one. The Asylum? Yeah. John, you've not played it yet. I think at some point, me and Amanda will come round and play it with you and Kaz because I think I think we're going to do well in that setting because it's, it's a nice little puzzle game and I okay. think Andy you've actually played the best puzzle for it me? yeah because the Asylum I? I think is still the, is, is the best one really? oh dear because mm. I wasn't that taken with it very quickly overview it's a almost like a point and click or mist style video game in a board game you have these panoramas which you choose which cards you're going to go look at you look at the card and it gives you clues and sometimes you'll have challenges which have rolled dice to complete expedition endurance is i think the fifth fourth module that's been released i think it's fifth if you include the ones in the box and so far they've all been a bit kind of hit and miss there's been good bits and bad bits and i'm not going to go into spoilers because it's a story driven thing with puzzles so if i say too much it'll spoil the ending but it did something really clever at the beginning so which none of the other modules are done and everyone kind of went Round the table at once. <gasps> Ooh, this is really clever. And then ten minutes later, it's back to you. Know, you remember you played point and click games, and you basically just grabbed something and you you know use this, yeah, use yeah. this, use this with this, use this with this. When you're stuck, you use everything with everything. A truckload <laughs> of useless knickknacks around and just rub them patiently against everything else. <laughs> it's. The other thing about time stories is it gets a bit like that, but you've got a time limit as well. So you've only got so many actions you can take. Hmm. So what you're doing is you're kind of splitting up and going, right, well, everyone look everywhere. <laughs> um, do we know where we're going? No. Um, let's go over there. Oh, that looks like the way to go. And it just it just felt you were going through the motions and it felt too linear. There was even like one point where it was a really nasty puzzle, which we kind of go, oh, crap, we knew what the answer would have been if we can go back. So two of us were trying to solve this puzzle and then someone else had found a note a way around it. So it was kind of like, okay, we're racking our brains out. What's the answer to this puzzle? Oh, we had the clues before. Could we go back? Should we guess it? Let's guess it for now. If we fail it, we can always go back in the next loop and find the actual answer. To which everyone else would just go, oh, we found the key and unlocked the door that was next to it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, oh, so that puzzle was a complete waste of time then. It's a bit disappointing. I guess it's good that there's multiple ways through the maze as it were but. yeah but it felt like because you're playing it as four players and you can split up yeah you know, what's the point in having these fiendish puzzles that require you to you know go get this evidence at a particular point where you can just go oh well, i'll just use this key we found maybe the remedy to that would be to have several different puzzles so that like if there's one easier way through the first bit the second bit's then much harder and vice versa so if yeah. there's more than one route you that get stuck in different it. ways However, I just felt this entire module was just, apart from the initial impact, it was just linear. It was just to go to A, to B, to C, to E, to E. Oh, we have a fight at the end. Oh, we've won. No. Oh. There was, was no mystery. There was, there was a mystery, but we didn't feel like we solved the mystery. Oh, a bit disappointing then. It if it, it, it feel like Sherlock Holmes has just banged on the wrong door and gone, oh, oh, yes, you're the killer. Oh, right, there we go. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like it's a shame, really. Yeah, so I'm, I, I, I keep thinking to myself, is this the last time stories module I'm going to buy? And then I was on Chaos Cards today and noticed they're taking pre-orders for the next one. I nearly went, ooh. <laughs> when will you learn, Steve? When will you learn? <laughs> Never, obviously. 
<laughs> but one of the things that were, uh, one of the players said at the table, which was quite interesting, is he's also been playing a lot of the Arkham Horror LCG. And he said the Arkham Horror game is now doing this kind of puzzle better than Time Stories. Because the problem with Time Stories is it is a one play thing. Once you've, you get several loops, several attempts to complete yeah. this mystery. But once you've done that mystery, you know the answers to the puzzles, you know what you're doing. That's what Time Stories is about. It's almost like a bit of trial and error as you have to keep going through the loops trying to do it. Mm-hmm. We said, but with Arkham Horror, the game itself randomizes itself subtly. And also you can approach it with different characters and different decks that you're going to build yourself. So the game itself is a lot more replayable. That's good. Because you can approach it in different ways. And there's different difficulty levels as well. That's nice as well when you play it with a lot of different people and you want to introduce people. Mm. Like if you've got that starter mission that brings everyone into it, but every time it's the same fucking starter mission. <laughs> <laughs> It can get pretty tedious to introduce people to the game to the point where you're like, yeah, let's just play something we've all played before uh, because I really can't be bothered to go through this again. <laughs> so, yeah, I started... I mean, it, uh, the way I wrote it about the, the review I wrote, I was playing with a group of people I played the other Time Stories modules with. So we've now played like three or four of these modules with the same group. And so in a way, it felt like going out for a meal with your mates. Yeah. Okay. You know, we're all back and getting together and having a chat and enjoying yourselves. But it's going somewhere and the meal's a bit naff. It wasn't an awful meal, but at the same time, it's like, oh, I probably wouldn't go back to that restaurant kind of thing. <laughs> ah, <laughs> it's the Nando's effect. Oh, ridiculously spicy. <laughs> I like Nando's. Oh, do you? You like Nando's? Yeah. Oh, really? I thought Nando's was shite. Nando's isn't that bad. It's my chubby chicken place of choice. <laughs> you have to go for a cheeky Nando's now and again, though. It's not that bad. Nando's, I mean, <laughs> uh, it's all right, but I was I, I, a lot of. I mean, a lot of people have I know have just said, "Oh, Nando's is brilliant. You should go." So I've been, and I thought, "Yeah, I wouldn't call it brilliant." No, I like it, but I wouldn't call it brilliant. I prefer Bodega. Anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> hang on, that's a completely different place. <laughs> it is, but it's better. I know it's, Guys, like, it's not chicken or anything, but it's you know, it's I, I prefer. You know, if you're going to go guys, for chains that are probably in a lot of cities, then... Uh... Guys, over here. No! Ooh. We're talking Ooh. fast food. <laughs> Someone punch him out. <laughs> yeah. oh, so I God. played a game, right? <laughs> Jesus. Hang on. You're not going to believe it. I played one game this month. <laughs> really? Which one? Yeah, and until Aircon, <laughs> that board gaming convention, which we enjoyed... I hadn't played it before, uh, but I've played this game again, and the game is Tsuro, and I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it. Tsuro, yes. Tsuro. Tsuro. So it's a Japanese game. Yes, pink. And the basic idea is you've each got a little stone counter, and you need to guide it around a sort of maze that evolves as you place tiles down, which sounds simple enough, except that any counter that, that connects to that tile then moves all the way to the end of the path it can follow. So each of these tiles got a bunch of little tracks, uh, and as you put the tiles down, your little counters disappear all over the place. So it sounds quite simple, but once you've got like four or five people all putting counters down and moving the tiles in the different places, it can go very wrong for you very quickly. Yes. So you can you can try and... Basically, you've got to keep your counter on the board for as long as you can, by following these little tracks. And as soon as you go off the board, you're out. <laughs> so if you're stupid enough to put your card down where someone else can put their card right right in front of you and they've got a card that loops it right back, Steve, <laughs> 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 then basically in your first turn, you can go out, as my wife proved. <laughs> that was yeah. funny. Tron Light Cycles, the board game, I call this. Yeah, yeah pretty that's much a good is, analogy. Yeah. yeah. It's good, because, yeah, if you collide with another player, you're both out as well. Yeah. It's really good fun, and I, one thing I really love about this game is that you can teach it in about two or three tiles. Like, you can you can explain it, but people get it within a couple of moves. So if you're playing it with family members, as I did recently, you could see that little smirk, the little grin on the side of their face appear about two counters in where they're like, oh... It's not as simple as I first thought. And now I can screw him up because I can send him off this way and then he goes all the way back around this little thing and whoop, off the board. <laughs> so, yeah, it's uh, I, I really like it. 
It is. It, it's it's curiously fun actually for a, a simple game. There's a lot to it, mm. and there is actually quite a bit of strategy when you get into it. Yes, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. There's there's you get three tiles you can choose to place down at any time, and reserving some tiles is actually I found useful. Yeah, you, know, you think, oh, I'm gone. That can get me out of a bind. That one can in most circumstances. So I won't use that one now. I'll save that one for later. Yeah. <laughs> There's also an element of trying to avoid people for as long as you can, except there is certain opportunities where you're like, well, if I can get to them in that tile and they're coming from the left, which they have to be because there's nothing else they can do, then I can screw them up because I can send them back down the channel they came down, which means they go, and they're dead. <laughs> it's also quite nice that it's quite a quick game. It is, yeah. Because, because there's player elimination and people are going to get knocked out of that game all the time. Yeah, but mm. because it's so short, it doesn't matter. It's not like someone's sitting there twiddling their thumbs for half an hour. No, yeah, I think the longest game that we played was sort of ten minutes, and that's because someone was taking far too long to t- play their damn cards. Dad, <laughs> <laughs> did they get stuck in analysis paralysis? Uh, a little bit, yeah. But I mean, everyone enjoyed it, and that's the that's the crucial point. Like you mm. say, a very simple game can be quite quick to go through, um, and I found. Th- Whenever we've played it, we've probably played something in the region of half a dozen rounds before you know, before we've given up. Yeah, it's it's a good filler game. It's really it is as you say. It's sort of ten or fifteen minutes job done, and it doesn't really matter whether you've got four players playing or eight players playing. It's still only going to be fifteen minutes because there's still the same number of tiles. Mm. That's right. Has either of you played the um, second version? I looked at it. In fact, um, at Aircon, I bumped into a guy. He's, I can't remember the name of his business now, but basically he's a board game seller, um, juggling something or other. Travelling man. Travelling man. No, it was definitely juggling something or other because I'd, I've actually met him before <laughs> through my previous life as a uh, poi spinning or poi LED poi producing. Uh, a hippie. Kind of hi- hippie. <laughs> <if you want. laughs> I used to go to conventions uh, for people who spun poi and did juggling stuff, and I'd feel like an odd one out, believe me. Goddamn hippies! <laughs> All right, Cartman. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, so I'd actually met this guy before, and he was described... We asked him what the difference between Suro and the other one, which was... Uh, it's like a sea-based one, and uh, the difference is sea monsters. <laughs> oh. Which uh, sort of march across the board and, generally speaking, screw up people's plans, was how he described it. Uh, he said he'd played it, but he found it it lost something by adding that to it. So I find it okay. hard to believe that adding a bit of chaos to a game makes it worse, but apparently <laughs> apparently, this game is better off when you can actually plan a little bit, because even you've got three tiles anyway, but there's only a limited amount of planning you can do. And because you're interacting with other people's plans you've already got your chaos in there. So when you add this other bit, it's just like, I'll just wait and see what happens. Mm. Oh, well, there's only this one I can do. So It yeah. wasn't uh, the lazy juggler, was it? That's the badger. Lazy juggler, there we go. Lazy juggler. Curse my poor memory. <laughs> <laughs> he says, drinking a beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's getting better. <laughs> what, the beer or the memory? Uh, both. <laughs> Excellent. Speaking of Aircon, there mm. was one other game we played there, which we mentioned, was it last time? My memory's going now. We, we mentioned it very briefly, yes. We did, which I think we should give a little more attention to, because we said we would. Mm-hmm. We are nothing but if true to our word. Well, Mostly. we are many things. <laughs> um, and that is Planetarium. Uh, Planetarium. Yes. You all right there, Steve? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Some kind of episode. Planetarium. Da, 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 da. He's doing it again. <laughs> are you okay, Steve? <laughs> he's, he's, seriously, are you having a seizure? <laughs> a senior moment, as my father would call it. <laughs> it's definitely a senior moment, yes. <laughs> <laughs> On the subject, I suppose, of spacey themes, so that's that seems to be my job tonight. Planetarium is another Kickstarter I, uh, I backed, which turned up um, earlier this year as well, actually. Um, sort of February time. And from... Hilariously enough, Game Salute, and all the way through the campaign, I remember Steve telling me, yeah, good luck getting that on time, Andy. (laughs) You know, the reputation they've got, you'll never see that, you won't see that till 2018. And you know what? It actually turned up early. 
fair Frankie. dues, I do have to eat humble pie. You do. Babe. I mean, admittedly, a day early, because I got it on the 28th of February. <laughs> it was due in March. Well done, still, guys. Well done. I do have yeah. to eat humble pie because their reputation was in tatters at one point. It really was. Um, I've actually backed their second one now, so we'll see how that goes as well, <laughs> which is called Farlight. The, the, the campaign's ended now, but uh, that's not due out until much later this year. How many pending Kickstarters have you got, Andy? Um, in total, including the ones that I've received already. Um, he says, man looks up thing on internet. Um... We can come back do, to do, you. Do, 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 do. 23. Do, 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 do. Jesus Christ. <laughs> 23. Yeah. That's that's since April last year, though. Oh, my God. 25. There you go, you see. <laughs> since April last year, Steve. Oh, no, it's about four since April last year. <laughs> it's 25 in total. In fact... But, uh, but the shinies... You guys have zero One, self-control. Two, three, four, five, I, no, absolutely six, none. Seven, none whatsoever. Eight, nine. It's ten since April last year. <laughs> Is that because you've run out of fingers, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> and kidneys. <laughs> <laughs> ten but, kidneys? <laughs> <laughs> well, Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are from Wrexham, you know, you're not normal. <laughs> um, yes, Planetarium. It is fun. Basically, simulating the form the formation of planets around a sun, around a star. For those of you scientifically inclined, planets are formed from an accretion disk when stars are born. So lots and lots and lots of crap is uh, floating around in a big ball, starts to spin around. Most of it ends up in the middle, which forms the star, and anything left over swirls around. Eventually, gravity pulls it all together, and you get planets. That's science, kids. That is science. Planetarium basically simulates this um, this process. So there are the game's up to four players, and there are coincidentally four planets in the game. They're not owned by the players though, and the idea really is simply there's a lots and lots and lots of resources orbiting this star. You move them, or you can either move planets into lumps or lumps into planets. Planets grab stuff and hoover them up in gravi- with gravity. You play cards which basically simulate the evolution and the changes of each of these planets through time so maybe they'll become sort of volcanic or they'll sprout oceans or become you know huge great balls of ice or whatever it is depending on the cards you play the cards you play will require a certain number of these resources which you assign to a planet you play that on the planet you get a number of victory points and at the end of the game which is what everything works up to, you get to play what are called uh, final evolution cards in the very last turn of the game, which essentially sort of lock in place the the state of that planet at the end of the game. But that's where it gets you noodle baked. Yeah, one of the crucial bits is that each of the cards have sort of different, whether it's like a short-term easy goal, which gets you a very small number of victory points, or it's a longer-term harder goal, which gets you more victory points, or like you say, a final end of game which you have to kind of is it one you get to begin with yeah you, you start off with one um but at the end of the game you can play up to four so the That's yeah right. the easy ones that you mentioned are called low evolution cards so they're sort of the easy short terms as you mentioned the 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 middle ones are the high evolution cards which are worth a lot more but more difficult to get and then the final evolution cards are only playable right at the end of the game and you basically have to shape the your, your entire strategy around right. these final evolution cards. So you can draw, when you play one of these cards, you redraw another card, but you can choose which one you want. So if you draw a final evolution card, you're not allowed to play them until the last part of the game. So you don't want to clutter your hand up too much with the final evolution cards, but you want a number of them in your hand so you can play at least one or two of them at the end to get yourself some final VPs. Yeah. Because... The final evolution cards have conditions on them about wh- what kind of planet you can play them on. So whether it's gaseous or rocky or... Uh, yeah, and as you play normal cards, so the low or high evolution cards, you affect the habitability of those plan- uh, planets, so whether yep. it can support life or not. And you can the, the, the status of those planets can change throughout their life as well. So one person could make something hospitable, 
the next time the, the cards play, play cards played on it, it could become inhospitable. And then the final <laughs> evolution cards can only play on a particular kind of planet. So no one knows what the, everyone else's final evolution cards are. So you no, don't know right. what everyone else is kind of heading towards. Yes. So you're all <laughs> like, well, I need that one. I need that gaseous planet over there to end up in a particular orbit. And it needs to be habitable. <laughs> yes. Uh, but it turns out, and you you quickly get the measure that someone else is working to a slightly different alternative objective. Yes. Because why are they moving it back out again? Or not, Stop moving move it. it back no, in no. Move it <laughs> out to the back. That's my point. Get your hands off it, you bastard. <laughs> no, we need it in the middle, Steve. We agreed on this now. Stop moving it. <laughs> we agreed on nothing. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the other thing is that you run out of moves as people um, play their cards. The tension in this game really does ramp up, doesn't it? It's Definitely. like, it does, okay, it does, this it is does. a nice, thinky, slow game. I've got plenty of time. Oh, my God, the game's over. <laughs> it really is. It's crazy. Because, I mean, if you think about it, you go around the game, you're like, well, one one counter moves, boom. One counter moves, boom. One counter... Holy shit, half the game's finished. What the hell? What the hell happened there? <laughs> Because <laughs> every time you play a resource, it goes onto a little track, and that track really isn't very long at all. So once you get no. to the end of the track, that's the end of the game. Mm. So you get right to the end of the game, and the person who puts the counter on the last disc of the track basically triggers the end game. So you get to this point where everyone's trying to <laughs> gingerly hovering around the very last turn of the game, thinking, am I in the position to win? Am I? No, no, I'm not going to play my last card. Um, John, it's your go. Do you want to do it? Um, no. no. Steve? No. Oh, right. Four Uh-oh. turns later, and there's a mad panic to move planets around into the right place. Have you got I any more like... metal? No! Bastard! Yeah, I was just oh. going to say, I quite like the fact that there's a limited amount of each resource, and you can be sat there thinking, it's no problem because I can go around to there, and then I can get that one over there, and then someone moves a planet the wrong way and sucks up the wrong resource, and you're like, well, uh, well it's okay because there's still two over that point, so I can still do some other stuff while I wait for that, to go- that one to come in. And then all of a sudden you're like, fuck, there's only one left, and Andy's just hoovered it up. Oh, fuck you all then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Flip the table, walk out. That's all of my objectives absolutely stuffed, right? Throw all the cards away. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. It's a brilliantly good game. And it is so pretty as well. Yeah, it is nice. Yeah, it's I really enjoyed well this. Made. Yeah, I really it's, enjoyed it. I mean, that, that point where you are, you're, you, you're trying to spinning plates at this one point. We're like, okay, I can move this planet up there. I can hoover up that resource there. I can move it. Okay, John's moved this planet further towards the sun. That's okay. I've got two more turns. No, no, he's moved it really far to the sun. Too hot, too hot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's right, it's right. I don't need that planet. I can go for the gas planet that's on the outskirts of the solar system. We can do. Oh, and now that one's been moved in by John. John. <laughs> mm-hmm. I need a rock. I need a rock. Oh, it's just gone. Oh, for the love of God. However, that point when you can get that final evolution card and go, aha, my planet is in the Bing. inner rim. It's habitable and is lush and verdant. <laughs> Indeed. Mm. And I have two pieces of metal to play on it, and I end up with a Chthonian planet. All hail Lord Cthulhu. (laughs) (laughs) That is one thing I did actually like about some of the cards on it, because if you read them, um, a lot of them actually have... They even have science on the cards about certain (laughs) planetary effects and evolution things, if if you're into that kind of stuff. But the designers have actually had a bit of fun with it as well. I didn't put them in our game. Oh, right. Because they're... They add um, a couple of extra, um, more advanced ideas. But they've added things like planet Vulcan. And I say, a Chthonian <laughs> planet. So it is literally Cthulhu mythos. So you can tell you can tell the designers are definitely geeks um, because they've included elements of things from Star Trek and, and Lovecraft and various other bits and bobs as well, uh, which I thought was a nice touch. They're all very subtle and they're not o- overdone, but it's all in there. And I think it's quite a nice little package. I think there's probably redundancy there because if they've designed a board game, there's an excellent chance they're geeks. Well, yes, <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Point taken. Um, but yeah, I'm really glad I backed it. It's a really nice game. And it's not overly long either, as you, as you, as you pointed out, Steve. All of a sudden, the game's over in about two Ooh. turns. Nobody knows what the fuck's going on. And you're like, oh, shit, we finished. And I can't play any cards. I think it's fair to say that this is one of those very few games in existence that's up there on the Polyhedron Collider unanimous we like this game board. I think you might be right. Yes, the three stars. Wow. Or the, or the three monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> three Michelin three monkeys. Award? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But yeah, I mean, it was um, $29 um, for the Kickstarter back, um, copy. Mm. Um, although there was about $15 of shipping, something like that, which was quite Do, do you know how much the exorbitant. current RRP is? I understand it's £40. Pounds. Um, in fact, I saw it at Travelling Man over the weekend for 40 quid. Okay. Um, which That's I, tempting. It's it's on the expensive side. It is, yeah. For an all-cardboard game. I think Was it all cardboard? It was all yeah, cardboard, pretty much. Right? Yeah. Um, mm. yeah, it's all punched cardboard, basically, and a few cards. Uh, there's a few little... Um, it look, I mean, all the little sort of um, transparent cubes and stuff look like sucky sweets. They look like boiled sweets. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But so if you uh, if you lose them, you can just replace them with with bonbons or something or mint imperials. Just don't lick them first; it ruins <laughs> the game. John, oh no, I'm not touching that. <laughs> That's the way I secure my win. <laughs> just lick all the lick the board. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want that resource, Andy? No, not anymore, John. <laughs> um. <laughs> According to, according to Games Law, the IRP is forty quid. Yeah, I think forty quid is probably. I think a little on the pricey side for what it is, uh, if I'm fair, if I'm honest. It's probably worth more than 30, but less than 40. Hmm. Maybe somewhere between 30 and 35 pound, I think it'd be probably a better price for it. I think the online discounted price at the moment seems to be in the region 32 to 35. So, yeah. I would say that's probably reasonable. Yeah. Because it's, it's a very high quality game. The artwork's lovely. Um, and it's, it's a very good game. So, yeah, 30 quid for that is. 32 is probably a very, very good price. Mm. Yeah, I'd say so. I'd, I'd pay that. Mm. In fact, mm. clickety-click. <laughs> <laughs> you should. It's a good game. No, I yeah. really enjoyed that. It was, uh, as you said, that, that point of you want to subtly make it your, your turn and subtly influence the, the planets and not make it completely overt that what you're doing is moving that part out to there. Oh, John's moved it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just collecting resources over here. It doesn't have to be in that orbit as long as it's in that orbit because it could be in either. That's fine. Well, what are you doing, Steve? <laughs> no, no, it's in the wrong orbit. This is not what we talked about. <laughs> and by talked about, I mean I agreed and you didn't. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So yeah, I would say yeah, cracking game. Yeah. So that was Planetarium by Game Salute. It is in stores now. Um so go out and buy it. It's very good. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to say that in about an hour, that's all we've got time for. We were gonna do our mailbag because it's quite literally bursting at the seams with letters. <gasps> it's bulging. Bulging. <laughs> it's, it's Are you leaving this on a cliffhanger, Stu? Stew. Bum, bum, Stew. Bum. Stew. <laughs> <laughs> no, Stew's Stew. not, but Steve. <laughs> you calling me Stew? I'm calling you Stew. You slag. Get out of my pub. Right, well, while these guys fight it out, <laughs> I think it's probably time to say goodbye to you lovely listeners. So, from us, the Polyhedron Collider crew, we'll see you next time. I've been John Cage. Oh, I've been Steve Tudor. And I've been Andy. Or possibly Elliot from auctions. <laughs> uh, I will see you guys soon. Catch you later. Trough.